So as I mentioned before, uh, population growth is slowing in most parts of the world. Utah is a rather unusual state in that it, uh, compared to other states in the United States, it has one of the highest rates of population growth, both because of immigration and uh, rate of natural increase. But that rate of natural increase, that is families having a large number of children, has been falling for the last century, um, just like that the rate of natural increase has been falling in the rest of the U.S. states. Utah lags by a few decades, but the pattern is actually the same. So Utah families are uh, on average smaller now than they have ever been in, uh, in, in the last 150 years. So population growth. Um, one position illustrated by Paul Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb, written in 1968, is that population high levels of population growth or uh, high uh, numbers of, of human beings make all ecological problems worse. So The Population Bomb was a book that made an analogy between increasing population sizes and a bomb that would explode and cause a lot of damage. The counter argument is illustrated by a book called The Ultimate Resource, written by an economist named Julian Simon in 1981. Simon makes the argument that the ultimate resource is humans and human ingenuity, and that as long as you have enough humans one of them is going to be able to figure out the answer to any problem. And therefore, in principle, large uh, sizes of the human population are not a problem. I'm going to switch to another screen now to show you that uh, Simon and Ehrlich actually had a uh, debate. Now, debate is perhaps not quite the right word. Here's a Wiki the, the Wikipedia entry for the ultimate resource. It talks about a wager between Julian Simon and Paul Ehrlich. I'll, maybe I'll just read this. Um, based on preliminary research for the ultimate resource, Simon and Ehrlich made a famous wager in 1980, betting on a mutually agreed upon measure of resource scarcity over the decade leading up to 1990. Ehrlich was the author of a, population, of a popular book, The Population Bomb, which argued that mankind was facing a demographic catastrophe with the rate of population growth quickly outstripping growth in the supply of food and resources. Simon was highly skeptical of such claims. Simon had Ehrlich choose five of several commodity metals. Ehrlich chose copper, chromium, nickel, tin, and tungsten. Simon bet that their prices would go down, and Ehrlich bet that their prices would go up. The basket of goods, which cost $1,000 in 1980, fell by, in price by over 57% over the following decade. As a result, in October 1990, Ehrlich mailed Simon a check for $576.07 to settle the wager in Simon's favor. So at least between 1980 and 1990, Ehrlich's prediction of increased resource scarcity did, did, not, did not come true. However, what this means for the future, of course, is completely up in the air. Box 3.5 gives caring capacity for humans at low, middle, or high input levels. Now, I'll have something to say more about caring capacity later on in this video. For now, I just want to elaborate on this point that, that this implies a trade-off between a large number of poor humans or a smaller number of richer humans and asks, is there such a trade-off? Now, if you think about resource limitations and resource scarcity, then, I mean, if you've got 100 tons of wheat and then the more people you have, the less number of tons per person uh, can be distributed. So, so in some sense, there's an obvious trade-off between the number of people and the amount of resources that each person can have. Uh, one needs to be careful, though, because 
we're what humans consume are not raw resources for the most part. They're resources that are produced by other people. And so you wouldn't want to say that if the, um, let's say, population of Utah fell to just three people, that then those people would be fantastically wealthy. Because those people, yes, there'd be a lot of resources for each one of those three people, but they wouldn't have the ability to exploit those resources. They wouldn't have the ability to use those resources. So, so, so the question isn't isn't as as uh, simple as it might seem at first. This also gets related to the debate about Im immigration. Um, if, for example, there are a fixed number of jobs, then clearly the more people you have in a Suppose there are a fixed number of jobs in Utah, then the more people you have in Utah, the higher the unemployment rate is going to be. And then the solution would be to try to decrease the number of people in Utah, not only by stopping immigration, but by encouraging out-migration, by encouraging people not to have many kids and the kids to move out of the state. Uh, but, but, you know, economic development activities by states uh, typically don't encourage people to leave they encourage people to come. And the reason is because there aren't a fixed number of jobs. And so when more people come to a place, those people are uh, potential consumers. And they, if they get jobs, that can actually generate more jobs in the economy, not just take away from a fixed number of jobs. So this, um, this question about is there a trade-off between a uh, large number of poor humans or a smaller number of richer humans, it's certainly true in some kind of very general sense. But when we get to specifics, then it's, it's not so obvious. The next question I wanted to raise, should a population enthusiast's goal, so suppose you have somebody who, who wants to increase the number uh, who's, who's, an, who's a supporter of high human populations. Should a population enthusiast goal be the largest number of people alive today or the largest number of people who ever live? Now some people might say there's not a trade-off, but maybe there is. And suppose if you have a large number of people alive today, they're going to damage the ecosystem so much that it becomes less sustainable or that it reduces the sustainable level of the human population in the long run. In that case, if your goal was the largest number of people who ever live, you might actually not want to achieve the largest number of people alive today. You might want to limit the size of today's human population in order to have more people living over a longer period of time. This distinction is rarely made, but it seems like it's an important one to think about if you happen to be an enthusiast about the size of the human population. Is it ethical to control population size? Well, we already discussed John Stuart Mill's idea on this, and his answer is yes, and he is, in some sense, the expert on, on, uh, on, on what the word liberty means and what freedom means. Now, one can certainly disagree with Mill, but it's um, it's interesting that Mill thought the answer to that, that question is yes, that it is ethical for government to control population size. The next question is, how would you do it? We all know, I think, about China's one-child-per-family policy, which got started in the mid-1960s and only ended just a few years ago. Or, I think it was between sometime between 2015 and 2018. I haven't looked it up. This was a quite draconian policy. Now, there were exceptions. If you lived in rural areas, if you were a minority, then you could have more than one child. But uh, but most people who, who lived in China were under this one-child uh, policy. And it was clearly a one-size-fits-all policy, that if you didn't fall into these categories that had exceptions, then regardless of what your personal preferences were, you had this one-child limit. Kenneth Boulding, remember the guy who wrote the, uh, the 
the distinction between the cowboy economy and the spaceship Earth. In, in 1964, and you can see the citation on here, page 335 of uh, Dailing Townsend's book, Valuing the Earth, Boulding proposed, well, let me just pause for a minute. If you think about, is, let's say you want to control population growth, how would you do it? Well, we've done a lot of studying this semester. If you want to control, say, pollution, how would you do it? Well, one way to control pollution is cap-and-trade policy. Another is a pollution tax. So building, so building, it's kind of natural for an economist to suggest if you want to control population, you have a population tax, a birth tax, or you have a cap-and-trade policy on births. So building in 1964 suggested a essentially a cap-and-trade uh, policy on birth, uh, transferable birth licenses. Uh, every woman gets maybe um, 21 birth licenses and you have to surrender 10 in whenever you give birth and these licenses are freely tradable and in that kind of way a couple that doesn't want to have any kids can sell their birth licenses to a couple that wants that wants to have more kids. Um, Daly points out one objection is that this is this it gives an advantage to rich people, but Daly says, well, welcome to capitalism. Uh, capitalism always gives an example to rich people. But over time, if rich people really do have more kids than poor people, then the rich people's estates and bequests get divided between more descendants than poor people. And so over the generations, the rich people's family gets poorer and the poor people's family get, get richer. Speaking about a birth license program, I switched the screen here to, this is an op-ed from the Salt Lake Tribune from August of 2009, where the author is entitled, Time for Re Reproductivity Tax. And if we go down, um, right, or we can do the sensible thing for the sake of our schools, our planet, and establish a cap-and-trade program on kids. You get two children free, but if you want a third, it's going to cost you. You have to buy a child credit and show your proof of purchase at the delivery room door. Here you can see uh, the author, Casey Jones, was a member of the Tribune editorial board. Now, the next week, he had a lot of React, got a lot of reaction to this column, and the next week, so this is the Tribune from August 8th, 2009, uh, the first sentence says, here's what readers are saying about Casey Jones's August 2nd political humor column, which satirically suggested solving Utah's classroom overcrowding problem by enacting a contraception cap and trade program. So I don't know whether uh, James uh, Jones, this journalist, was was serious or not, but certainly um, Bolding was serious. Herman Daly also talked about a uh, transferable birth license scheme because it 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 gives families choices. Um, if if they want more kids than two and they can afford to buy more birth licenses, they can have a larger family. Uh, it enables the government to choose a gross reproduction rate that's uh, that's not an integer. For example, 2.1. As I said, you can re you can give every woman 21 birth licenses and require that uh, 10 licenses be surrendered for each ch each child. And if this is going to happen anyway, if population growth is uh, is going to decrease anyway, then the price of these licenses would go to zero, and then uh, it wouldn't form a constraint for anybody. So returning to our previous uh, screen, that's the um, the, the building uh, birth license scheme, cap and trade scheme. Back back to box three point five. What does carrying capacity mean for humans? You. A carrying capacity has to do def be defined in a certain ecosystem. Uh, let me tell you a story about Garrett Hardin, who is the author of The Tragedy of the Commons. We talked about that earlier. When I was in graduate school, Hardin, who was a 
biology professor at University of California Santa Cruz came up to Stanford to give a talk and one of the things that was going on at the time was starvation in I believe it was Ethiopia so some um, East African country and Hardin said that from a biologist's point of view humans were starving because the size of the human population exceeded the carrying capacity of the environment and so the thing to do, at least in the long run, was would be to decrease the size of the human population until it was compatible with its natural environment, that it was sustainable within its natural environment. So in the question and answer session afterwards, I asked Hardin, what does that imply for New York City? The population of New York City is clearly vastly higher than the sustainable population of the land that New York City is on. And Hardin said, well, that's different from the, the African case because the people in New York City have money. So they can buy food that was grown in places far away from New York City. I didn't then ask a follow-up question, but another graduate student who was, I think, in the biology department did ask a follow-up question and said, well, then you're not really making an argument about science and biology you're making an argument that's about economics and how much money people have. So the question, it's, it's pretty clear what it means for the size of the global human population to be sustainable on the entire Earth. But does it make sense to have, to define carrying capacity, so we can define carrying capacity for the Earth. Although even then, as I as I said over here, there may be a trade-off between short-run carrying capacity and long-run carrying capacity. So even there, the notion of carrying capacity might not be so simple. But defining the carrying capacity for a unit that's smaller than the entire Earth seems to be problematic. I mean, do, do we want a country like Ethiopia to be sustainable? Uh, do we want a state like Utah to be sustainable? How about Alaska? How about the city of New York? Um, how about a particular neighborhood of Seattle? So w what, is, what is the appropriate scale? And I'm not sure that there is an appropriate scale other than the entire, the entire Earth.